Our guest in this episode is known as the Forest Maker and was instrumental in what has been described as probably the largest positive environmental transformation in all of Africa. From Blue Tribe Media, this is the Good Business Podcast, the show where we talk to business leaders, social entrepreneurs and innovators about aligning profit with purpose and how you can make doing good, good for business. Now here's your host, James McGregor. Today's guest is Tony Renato, who's World Vision's Climate Action Advisor, but he's more famously known as the Forest Maker because Tony helped transform millions of hectares of dry land in Niger in what has been described as probably the largest positive environmental transformation in all of Africa. You see, over 25 years ago, with the help of local farmers in Niger, Tony began implementing a conservation farming system, which is known as farmer-managed natural regeneration, which basically involves growing trees as an integral part of agricultural land. This approach has been so successful that it has been applied in at least 24 other African countries. Now, for many people, Tony is certainly an environmental hero after making a positive impact on food security and environmental sustainability and resilience for thousands of vulnerable communities living around the world. In this episode, we talk to Tony about his mindscaping superpowers, the challenges of getting farmers to change their practices in Nigeria and how he overcame them, resulting in the growth of 200 million trees on 5 million hectares of degraded farmland in that country alone. This episode is about how to engage with communities to create positive change and proves that not all superheroes wear capes. So why don't we start with uh, for people who may not know who you are, why don't you introduce yourself Introduce yourself and tell us who you are. Thank you. So my name's Tony Renardo, and um, while I have been the Senior Natural Resources Advisor, that title's recently changed. I'm now the Climate Action Advisor, but actually doing the same stuff. Um, I'm married. Uh, my wife Liz and I have four married children and eight grandchildren. I grew up in northeast Victoria, uh, studied agriculture, and Liz and I spent 17 years in West Africa, largely doing land restoration work with local communities. And for the last 20 years, I've been working with World Vision on a more global scale. And uh, what would you say your superpower is? Superpower? <laughs> uh, I hadn't thought of that, but uh, perhaps patience because things take time. There are many, many setbacks along the way and, and you need to just grind on no matter what. <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. I think uh, so a lot of our audience will be people who work in the sustainability space. And I often describe being a sustainability professional as a bit like chasing a parked car. Sometimes the harder you run, the more it hurts. Um, and and uh, things do seem to take a long time to get there, but it's uh, all for a very good, uh, good vision and purpose. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit uh, about your work with uh, World Vision. So I, I probably spend up to 50% of the year traveling, and um, that's divided more recently, particularly divided between visiting field offices in Africa and Asia and the Pacific, and then visiting support offices in the US and Europe. Um, while I'm at home, I, I spend a bit of time contributing to grant writing to try and design projects that will be really effective. I do a lot of media and communications, um, speak at various events and strategizing how can we best use uh, the, the gifts and the resources that we've got and really make a big impact. Uh, while I'm in the field, uh, a lot of what I do is creating awareness. And uh, I, I like to say, you know, people call me funny names like the forest maker and the tree whisperer. But actually, 90, yeah, 95% of what I do is regreening mindscapes. And if I can win that battle and convince people that it's in their best interest to work with nature instead of fighting against it, the, the regreening actually occurs quite spontaneously. So um, creating awareness, teaching, visiting projects and uh, engaging with stakeholders, government and other partners. When I'm in developed countries, I'm, I'm usually speaking to donors, uh, policy makers and often attending international forums, uh, addressing issues of land restoration and, and climate change. 
Yeah, awesome. I, I'm gonna. Uh, I think I'll retitle you as the mindscaper. I think <laughs> I like. I, I like. I like that term because that, like, it's really. It's really important. I think one of the things we talk to when we do all of our projects is actually the very first thing you need to do, regardless of whether it's a social enterprise trying to address homelessness, or whether you're a sustainability manager within an organisation just trying to get more renewable energy onto your projects. The very first thing you need to do is sort of get people on board and to bring them with you. Um, and so, like that. That mindscaping is is like a superpower. If you can do that really, really well, it just helps you get to where you want to go with the impacts you're after. For, for sure. M- mindset change precedes any action. You, you, if you don't um, win on that battlefront of what people believe, um, what they assume about the environment and livelihoods and so on, then it's very hard to convince them about anything else. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent agree. So now I wanted to go back a little bit in time, actually, probably a fair bit in time, uh, all the way back to nineteen eighty three. So uh, I'm really interested in your backstory. Like how how is it that you, you know, I guess, a person with a bit of agricultural background, how did you end up in Africa, working with local farmers, um, looking at more sustainable ways of farming? Well, it goes well before 1983 because I was already in West Africa for two and a half years by then. And I'd say growing up in northeast Victoria, Myrtleford actually, I just loved the bush, loved nature, um, but felt very angry at the destruction of the native forest that I saw around me and through the use of pesticides, uh, powerful pesticides, poisoning the rivers, killing the fish, and even bulldozing the rivers to make them drain more efficiently. I I didn't understand ecology, but I could see that something was plainly wrong. At the same time, I'd read widely and watch the news, and I, I was very upset. We were actually, farmers were actually growing tobacco in that district, while children just like me, who through no fault of their own happened to be born somewhere else, we're going to bed hungry. And I, I think there's a lot of anger there, a lot of um, just feeling impotent. But I, I threw up this child's prayer and I, I just asked God, please, somehow, somewhere, use me to make a difference. And, and that's really been the driving force behind me. I went on to study agriculture at university where I met my lovely wife. I uh, joined an organization that took me to Niger, working with amongst the poorest people in the world. So, yeah, that, that's a bit of the backstory. Right. And so so when you got to uh, Nigeria and you were working in these communities, I mean, what, was there a – I mean, how did you end up getting to work with the farmers around sustainable farming? Was there a particular moment or was there an event that occurred then that like really – triggered something um, um, around yeah in, within that organization i i went to manage a pre-existing uh wood lot and windbreak project and um the, the, the part of the history is as populations grew people moved up from the southern border area into new farming areas clearing the land as they went unfortunately there was a, a bit of a perfect storm where even though we didn't know it at the time, climate change is having a big impact. And the region has had one of the biggest step downs in rainfall of any region of the world, up to 30% average rainfall reduction, but also this massive deforestation contributing to desertification. And so I, I stepped in to manage this, um, it was called the Maradi. Maradi is the, the city and the district that I went to, the Maradi Woodlot and Windbreak Project. But, yeah, the situation was dire when I got there. I I really was confronted by a landscape on the point of ecological collapse, barely able to support life on Earth. And so if you think in terms of the the physical issues, um, because those trees have been cleared, ground-level wind speeds could exceed 70 kilometres per hour. So even when people did plant their crops, they'd be sandblasted, they'd be buried, Uh, Soil surface temperatures in excess of 60 degrees Celsius. Even in a normal year, um, the the climate there, you have eight months dry season. But if you add to that a a drought, it was catastrophic for their livestock and for their crops. Then the the loss of biodiversity meant uh, when things did grow, you'd have um, pest explosions, locusts, um, caterpillars, various insects causing problems. So within these communities, were they aware of what was going on in terms of um, this issue of 
you know, the deforest were they, were they ever, were even aware that the, there was a connection between the deforestation and what was going on, or were they just literally trying to get on with their lives? Well, yeah, for the most part, trying to get on with their lives. And I, I think, well, first, is very traditional society, so a lot of people would say it was the will of God. They had been brought up believing that they were doing a good thing. Their, their parents and grandparents had been pioneers, taming the wilderness and converting it into productive land. And so a lot of people didn't make the connection Although I think there was probably a good number that did, but the policies of the country were a little bit perverse. They, they had a good intention to protect the diminishing forest, but when you, well, when, when they made the, all the trees belong to the government, it, it disenfranchised the people actually living on the land. And the attitude became, well, if it's not my tree on my farm, and if it's not your tree, I'd better take it today before anybody else does. And and I suspect that even though a lot of people would have been uh, quite aware of the need for trees and the benefit of trees, that fear of losing the, the trees on their own land stimulated them to, to be even more destructive. Then, then there were other attitudes where if you see under certain trees right towards the, um, the, the base, there, there is definite competition with crops and there's a perception that trees grow slowly. So what's the use? I'm hungry today. I, I need to get on with life. So there are a lot of misconceptions there about the value of trees. So can you maybe tell us a bit about the, the solution that you thought was going to be the way to go when you, you know, I guess you first confronted with this issue, um, which, which ultimately became you know the farm managed natural regeneration approach that you've come up with? Um, what, what, what was what do you think what was the first thing you thought you had to do to try to fix this problem? Well, we like everybody else, we were gung ho planting trees. Um, it's like a knee jerk reaction because you see this apparently cleared land, and the impact of those winds and the high temperatures, the loss of biodiversity. We thought, ah, we've got to get trees back into this landscape, and we really gave it our best shot. I, I read widely, I consulted experts, I experimented with different methods, but nothing worked in a sustainable way, an economically viable way. Probably 80, 80, 90 percent of the trees died. And most critical of all was the fact that the people weren't interested. They, they actually called me the mad white farmer. <laughs> And um, you, you could understand why. They're, they're often hungry. They're very poor. Who can wait around for a tree that somebody else might steal anyway? So it, it was very discouraging. And I, I could have quite easily given up at that stage. Fortunately, um, uh, pe people, there's very little mechanization there. People still using hand tools. And even though we didn't realize that many of the trees which had been cleared were still there. They were, <laughs> they were present but underground. So the living tree stumps, sometimes even bits of root with the ability to sprout, and certainly millions of seeds spread across that landscape with the potential to regrow. And for me, th this was this was the light bulb moment because I, I thought I was fighting the, uh, the Sahara Desert, that I would need a big budget and many, many staff and years to do this based on the struggles we were having. And at that point, when I, I saw the tree stumps for what they really were, everything changed. And I, I realized those false beliefs about environment and trees, those negative attitudes and the destructive practices, that was the battlefield. And if I won on that fighting field, then the rest would be relatively easy because everything you need is actually already in the landscape. And what's needed is not so much what you bring to the table, but what you stop doing. Stop burning, stop removing all woody biomass, don't plow every square inch of your farm and control uh, livestock. And if I can, and and the the key, how, how do you do that? You know, I mean, these people, it's all they knew. Uh, they're in desperate situation. How do you bring that change about? And uh, what what I've learned over the years is every parent wants a better future for their children than the current reality they're experiencing. And if I can convince farmers and communities that it's in their best interest that they'll have a more productive farm 
and greater income and their children will have a future, if I can convince them of that through through working with nature, then the rest would be relatively easy. I mean, where did you start? I mean, this, you know, I guess you've had this light bulb moment that all the resources you needed were there, but really it's coming down to how you bring a community with you and convince. I mean, I mean, this 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 challenge translates across you know the current issue we have around climate change mm. or getting pe- people to um, reduce the amount of food waste in their homes. I mean, how do you get like whole communities come with you? I mean, where did, where did you even start mm. to um, yeah to, great. to solve that problem? Great question, and there's a lot of lot of um, side stories to this, but I there was a lot of serendipity, <laughs> a lot of hard work, and, and persistence. So f- first of all, critically important to win trust. Why why should they listen to a foreigner? And I, I was young to boot, and, and in those cultures, elders have precedence. They have the wisdom. So who, who was this kid trying to tell us what to do? And he needed to build, build that trust. Fortunately, uh, the organization I was with had a history there of helping in previous famines with health, with agriculture, and so on. So I, I inherited that bank account of goodwill. But then I had to add to it my own goodwill as well. And um, I started to help people where they hurt. So many villages had insufficient water supply or none whatsoever. Crop yields were only in the order of around 350 kilos per hectare. And that's that's hardly anything. An average-sized family needs at least a tonne of grain to get through the year, plus all the other needs for income. Um, so help with their agriculture and, and in other areas. So building up that trust, I think it's really important to be patient. We don't get our way overnight and not everyone's going to have the vision that you've got. So you, you need to be patient and bring people along with you. Uh, so I spent a lot of time teaching and following up. When I'd find a spark of light, some individual who was interested, you'd, you'd follow that person up and befriend them and help them. And important, particularly in the context where I'm an expatriate, to not be the big hero that flies in and flies out. So I'd very much build up local leadership and work through them and try to avoid being the saviour. There are a lot of downsides to that. And then it really helps if you've got something that works. (laughs) So so you you need to find out what works, win converts, and then publicise widely. (laughs) Yeah, so t- so tell me about those those first wins. So, um, I mean, some of those things you I mean ring true. Um, particularly, I guess modern social science. You know, we'd re- we'd refer to this now as community based social marketing, where you know you do some social modelling. You br- you bring in key leaders within that within that community that um, effectively reflect the model, the behaviour you want, and then eventually becomes a social norm. But I mean, what what were some of those early wins that you had that you were able to actually show people? Hey, this really works, and you know, here, here's the proof. I identified around about 10 people interested in at least trying this natural regeneration idea. And and keep, keep in mind that it was just so totally left field. For a generation, people had been clearing the trees and there were thoughts or uh, beliefs that a, a, a good farmer is a clean farmer, one who removes all, not just the trees, but the trash on the ground. And so for these guys to do this, um, it was a pretty brave step. But about 10 farmers in as many villages, and I had them working on this in a corner of their farms with the uh, understanding that, look, if it doesn't work, if it causes loss of income or crop yield, you're perfectly free to remove those trees at the end of the year. But let's give it a try. And it worked splendidly. The trees grew fast. Uh, you know, all the survival problems you have with tra- transplanting a seedling just aren't there when you're regenerating something from a stump. H- however, <laughs> um, for various reasons, jealousies, um, fear of change, dire need, uh, for those reasons, people would come at night and, and steal these emerging trees. And I think everything could have failed that year if um, if nothing happened. At, towards the end of 1983, there'd been a serious drought and crops failed to the point where people were hungry. And the, the, the further you went in time, people started to leave home because of very severe shortages of food. And we were able to turn that negative into a positive by saying, okay, if we can obtain 
food aid, we're going to distribute it, but it's going to be through a food for work program. And one of the work activities is to to regenerate 40 trees per hectare. And you can imagine the eyes rolling, what's Tony doing, but they were hungry. <laughs> and um, we were able to use that blunt tool of food for work to at least give a, a good percentage of the population exposure to this idea. By the end of 84, when the next season finished and they had a good rainfall season, the crops were abundant, we'd, we'd reached maybe, well, 100 villages. They had left half a million trees. And I thought, wow, this is the start that we needed. But immediately when we stopped the food aid, 75% of the trees got chopped out and people said, Finish with Tony, we'll get on with our lives. But the, the important thing is we had a critical mass. 25% of the farmers said, no, the guy's crazy, but actually these trees didn't do any harm. And we saw evidence that they're doing a lot of good, lower wind speeds, lower temperatures, more organic matter coming back into the fields, fuel wood. And some of the wild fruiting trees and fodder trees were coming back. So they said, no, we're going to go another year and see where this takes us and um, things spread from there. It just went viral as as farmers spoke to farmer and they learnt from each other. So what, what's the, uh, I'm a science geek, so what's, can you explain to me the underpinning science behind why having, I mean, you mentioned things about wind speed and cooling temperatures, those ones make sense. Is there any other uh, natural processes going on that having, yeah, these sort of mixed crops having trees within farms? Um, for, for sure. There's, there's, there's so much. Um and, and, and it's counterintuitive. You think more trees mean, firstly, less space for your actual crop, but also competition. But particularly in these low input regions, so very few people afforded fertilizers or pesticides or anything like that, but also with the added dimension of climate change, and this is where it's relevant to Australia, having that restoration of some level of trees on the landscape is so critically important. So I, I probably won't list them all. There's so many things, but our soils were very low in, in phosphorus and other essential uh, nutrients. And it turns out the fungi associated with the roots of these trees give greater access to scarce nutrients in the soil. Having an aerial canopy in that environment with the 70 kilometer per hour winds blowing off the Sahara, you're actually harvesting nutrient, well, it's not nutrient rich, but you're harvesting nutrients from the wider environment that are deposited on your farm. Getting organic matter back into the soil, um, you, you've got uh, cation exchange sites on that, that organic matter, but critically, it's going to hold moisture for longer and slowly make it available for the plants. And there's wonderful figures. For every 1% increase in organic matter in, in a hectare, you've got something like, is it 240,000 litres water storage capacity increase? So nutrition, moisture, the reduction in temperatures is amazing. Air temperatures under the canopy of the tree have fallen by at least 10 degrees Celsius at midday, and that's important enough. But soil surface temperatures reduce by 31 degrees. So if you can imagine, at, um, un unshaded air is 72 degrees. If you can imagine your germinating crop pushing through 71 degrees Celsius surface, it's already challenged. It's going to be vulnerable uh, to insects and disease and drought. Reduce that by 50% and you've given it a head start. The thing that we didn't know, and this is what I find really amazing, many of these species are exhibiting hydraulic lift. They're extracting water through their taproot from deep layers in the soil. And at night time, the, the shallow roots are leaking within the vicinity of the roots of the crop. Now, and it just goes on. A number of these trees are nitrogen fixers. And, you know, we could be here all day on why it works. And um, it's, it's just amazing. And, uh, yeah, Mother, Mother Nature is the ultimate science geek, eh? It has spent millions a year perfecting the process and our industrialization is trying to reverse engineer it. And, and um, ignore it, uh, destroy it at yeah. your peril. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was interested in the, uh, where you mentioned the fungus. So I, I recall reading um, an article which was talking about how trees communicate and actually transfer 
so you know the, the primary the primary tree basically creates sugar through photosynthesis, which uses to feed the fungus, and the fungus then is at a super specialist at harvesting particular minerals from the soil. So you get this sort of relationship between the two. Mm. It's fascinating stuff. Mm. Yeah. So you know this you know program or idea you know that this you know this light bulb moment that you had has eventually been described as probably one of the largest positive environmental transformations perhaps in all of Africa. I mean, what what has been the ongoing impact of that idea that sparked in your brain way back in 1983, yeah. 84? Um, I, I'll share that. Uh, j- just a little caveat there that while we definitely played a significant role and we hosted exchange visits back and forward across the country and we proactively promoted this, um, it's it's simply an adaptation of what had been a traditional system. And so there were examples in, in Niger and, and now that I travel with World Vision, I find it around the world, individuals with no outside contact who'd also – uh, redevelop the same ideas. I, I just wanted to put that little caveat in there and not claim all of the credit, sure. um, but it's been astounding. So in Niger today, there are more than 6 million hectares of farmland with with a covering of trees. So uh, uh, in 1980, average tree density was four trees per hectare. Today, the average is around 40. So we're talking about 240 million trees in the landscape that weren't there several decades ago. Now, you might say, so what? Is this just a you know, go and hug the trees thing? No, no. Average um, crop yields, because of the improved microclimate and fertility and so on, farmers in Niger are growing an additional 500,000 tonnes of grain per year uh, without inputs or subsidies or irrigation or any of the extras that you could add and Niger is one of the poorest countries in the world, but the gross income, the value of what they consume directly plus what they sell is in the order of $900 million per year. So it, it's had a very big impact. And then add to that the other layers. Now there's more natural resources to go around. So conflict, which is historical there, particularly between different tribes and between herding groups and cultivating groups, the conflict in the areas that have taken this up seriously has reduced. And in some areas, there's now things for young people to do. So out-migration and um, urbanization has has reduced. So it, it's just been staggering. And then Niger itself, because of those amazing impacts, it's become a a beacon of hope to the world, really. So many, many countries across Africa are taking this approach on board and organizations, global organizations are starting to champion this approach to land restoration. Yeah, amazing. Amazing figures in there. It just shows how you know, these uh, often sustainability um, initiatives have all these uh, mutually supporting benefits. So they're not well, just it, like it a bolt-on It makes me quite thing. angry when some, some people argue that you've got to care for the economy when when actually the the reverse is true. If you care for the environment, the economy will be much better than you could imagine. Plus, it'll, t- it'll last for the future generations. So there's, there's a lot of myths being peddled out there that just aren't true. That's that's the entire basis of this podcast. Is that, <laughs> that it, doing doing good is actually good for business? Um, and even I guess the current stance in Australia around um, how we're going to deal with our own carbon emissions. Um, one of the thing, one of the things that really frustrates me, when, and we often hear this figure bantered around, you know, is Australia only produces one point three percent of global emissions. Now, if I put a business hat on that, I think that's a, that's an awesome number because Australia is an innovation nation. You know, we, you know, we invented solar hot water, right? You know, we're the world, you know, we're the world's best researchers in solar photovoltaics. Um, and if I think of that one point three number, what that means is that for every solution we solve here in Australia. You know, it's around at one percent. There are ninety nine other customers out there in the rest of the planet that need exactly the same solution. So, you know, it's a massive business opportunity for um, Australian businesses yeah. to actually solve these sustainability problems, um, as well as you know, be good for the economy. It's it's a very poor excuse for not showing leadership, and we we can tilt the balance by our influence. And yes, yeah, yeah, certainly our research and technological um, capacity, but just to show leadership, others will follow. Why, why should we follow others um, on, on a spiraling downward trail to destruction? What, what's the glory in that? 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you've got yep. me wound up now. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. good mate. Makes for good podcasting. So, so, so now that you're all wound up, and, uh, and I'm sure the audience is as well. Um, yeah, the people listening out there, you know, there's going to be people out there who uh, have are facing similar challenges to you. They may not be in Nigeria and dealing with you know farmers, but they're they've got these barriers to try to get people to um, change their practices or adopt yeah, new, more sustainable products and services. What's what's one piece of advice that you would give to uh, someone like that? Follow your dream and your passion. And in, in doing that, read widely, speak to others in the field. Uh, certainly learn from your mistakes and failures because in, in reality, they're just stepping stones to doing it better and don't give up. Good advice. Yeah, in particular, yeah, that, have that mission focus as well. So that um, I think if you your mission focus rather than product focus, it, focus, it always helps. So, all right. So, if someone wanted to get in touch with you, or um, they wanted to learn more about uh, or engage with World Vision, um, what's the best way for them to connect? Yeah. So, there's, there's two websites for for the work that I actually do. Um, go to FMNR Hub. If if you Google FMNR, you'll find it. And if they wanted to contact me, there is um, um, a, a write-in uh, contact us section. And then for information on World Vision, just Google World Vision Australia. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. We'll put the links for that uh, on the show notes for people who uh, might be driving or running. You can't write that down right now, but um, please reach out to uh, Tony and uh, contribute to World Vision as well. I'll do some amazing uh, work. So. All right, so let's um, wrap up to what we call our Mad Minute, which is uh, five, quick, five quick questions in 60 seconds. So what, what's the best piece of advice you've ever, ever received? When I was a very unsure teenager, I read uh, The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale, and I'd say just the importance of having a positive mental attitude, believing in yourself and, and believing in a God who loves you and has your best interest at heart. Great. And what's your favourite business book? Or well, maybe maybe it's a agronomist book. Who knows? Well, yeah, lots of books have influenced me. Um, probably one that sticks out is "See You at the Top" by Zig Ziglar, and it stresses the importance of integrity and character as the foundations of success. Just goes through the the usual stuff: having a goal, making a plan, managing time, and taking the first step. And then some really smart quotes in there like um, er eradicate stinking thinking and have a checkup from the neck up. Very very catchy writer. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Very very good. I like that one. Um, When you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Exactly what I am now. Help people and plant trees. (laughs) Yeah, awesome. It goes back to that prayer you said when you were a kid, I guess. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's your favourite quote? Well, again, lots of them, but if I had to pick one, perhaps um, Victor Hugo, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Yeah, oh, that's one of my favourites as well. And if you could go back in time and give your 20-year-old self some advice, what would it be? So take the long view. In life, there are many reversals and even, um, uh, yeah, many reversals. So few people um, experience overnight success. Uh, it's normal to face obstacles and problems, blockages, and even one person or event can reverse years of work. But if you believe in what you're doing, keep the end result in mind and persevere. Great. And would your 20-year-old self have listened, do you think? Would, would, would I? Well, I was very impatient. I, 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 would, have, <laughs> I would have taken it on, on board, but I would have been chomping at the bit a little. <laughs> I I was just gung-ho to make change, you know. Young young people aren't noted for their patience. Patience. (laughs) So I'll have to – yes, I try to have that conversation with my children all the time. But uh, (laughs) falls on their fears. All right, well, that's it. We're done. Thanks for um, your time, Tony. Um, I I like the quote that's on World Vision sites. People go and check out Tony's profile on World Vision that uh, not all superheroes wear capes. And I I know you're quite modest in that, you know, there was obviously lots of people in this journey on this um, amazing thing that you did over there in Africa. But we uh, appreciate your time and your insights and your wisdom. And uh, hopefully... Uh, there's at least one person out there listening who is going to make a difference and they'll go on to the be a change maker like you as well so thanks for joining us on the Good Business Podcast oh, thanks for the opportunity James and it's been great spending time with you well what a great story now before you go you know how I have the mad minute at the end of each interview how would you like to ask one of those questions simply record your message using your phone and email it to me 
at podcasts with an S at bluetribe.co and you might feature on one of our future shows. Now, if you heard something today that you wanted to write down but weren't able to, don't worry. We've taken all the notes for you and you can access the notes from today's episode by simply visiting www.bluetribe.co forward slash podcast. Also, if you like today's episode, make sure you click that subscribe or follow button and leave us a rating. Coming up in the next episode. When I was starting to plant churches that sometimes you think that the mission itself is enough and that because you have an important mission, the venture will be successful, but that's not necessarily true. From planting churches to being only days away from launching a new e-commerce venture, this entrepreneur is on a mission to create a business for good. Well, that's it for another episode. I'm James McGregor. Until next time.